Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And jo Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph, is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years. And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. And you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Genesis 50, 15 through 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Over the past year, we've been going through the book of Genesis, and we only have two weeks left, this week and next week. And this week, we're going to be considering the reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers. We're breaking with normal tradition, which is just to go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and instead we're looking a little thematically at these last couple of chapters, because what happens is you have a bit of a sandwich. You have the brothers kind of reconciling, and then after Jacob dies, they feel the need to reconcile again, and so we're gonna just do those two together, and then we're going to look at the middle of 46 through 49 next week, and we look at the blessings of Jacob before he dies. And so today we find ourselves at the very end of the Joseph narrative. We've been walking through this story for weeks and weeks, and so if this is your first week with us, I apologize. Hopefully you're familiar with the story. If not, I'll give you just a quick rundown. I'm not going to be able to tell it in full because we've been spending, you know, like six weeks going through this story already, but here is the basic gist of what's happening. Joseph is one of the 12 sons of Israel, 12 sons of Jacob. His name is Jacob or Israel, and and uh, he is the, the favorite son, and he knows he's the favorite. He is just a spoiled brat. He's given all the gifts. He is, uh, he is boastful in front of his brothers, and one day his brothers decide to take him out. At first they decide they want to kill him, but then they say, hey, let's, uh, let's, get, let's get a little money out of the deal, so that instead they sell him into slavery, and he's shipped off to Egypt, and when he is in Egypt, he is then put into someone's home, but before long he is... Um, 
he is sent and thrown into the prison. And so he spends 13 long years between slavery and Egyptian prison. It is not an easy life for Joseph before he is called into the throne room of Egypt to talk to Pharaoh and Pharaoh has a dream and Joseph is supposedly a dream interpreter. And so Pharaoh tells his dream to Joseph and Joseph interprets it and his interpretation is correct. He interprets that there's going to be seven years of plenty, great Great weather for crops to be grown, and then there will be seven years for famine. And so Joseph comes up with a plan to um, store grain over the first seven years and then to be able to distribute that grain during the second seven years so that all the people of Egypt might be able to live. And so Pharaoh puts Joseph in charge of all the things. He's basically acting as king, even though Pharaoh is, is still the figurehead, okay? At this point, Joseph's basically the prime minister, and the king is basically the queen, or the king, I guess he's a king now, it's a king again. Um, let's go Chuck. Um, so last week, what we talked about were the 11 brothers of, of Joseph go to him, they actually have to go twice to him, and, this, and then the third time they get brought before him, uh, they're in trouble, and Joseph is sending them through, them through a test to see if they have changed. You know, it's been a long time. It's been 20 years since they sold them into slavery. Have these brothers changed? And they pass the test, and then Joseph, this is where we pick up the story this week, and it's where we left off last week. We left off with this great cliffhanger uh, where Joseph sends, he, the brothers pass the test. He's re- ready to reveal himself to his brothers. He's, he's been relating with them for quite a while now, and they haven't known who he is, and he's put in a position of power over them. And so he sends all the Egyptians out of the room and it's just him and the Hebrews in the room and he looks at them and he says and he starts weeping at this point they think he's going crazy all of Pharaoh's house hears Joseph weeping so it's not that quiet silent weep that some of us experience this is the loud and vibrant weep okay that you have here Joseph is an expressive man he's screaming he's weeping and he says I am Joseph. And at that point, you hear all of the collective chins hit the ground. His brothers can't believe it. They're, sh- they're shocked. They're stunned. In fact, it says that they don't even know how to respond. They have no, it's like they're seeing a ghost. They thought Joseph was gone forever. And here he is. And he says, I am Joseph. It's the last thing that they were expecting in that moment for them to say, I, for him to say, I am Joseph. And then he invites them to come closer and to examine him because they don't believe it. I'm reminded of Jesus with his disciple Thomas as he invites him to come and inspect the holes in his hand. This is basically what Joseph is doing. It's as if Joseph is resurrected for these brothers. They thought he was long dead but here he is right in front of them. And here's what Joseph says to them. Now, do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. What insight, what perspective to be able to have. If I'm in Joseph's place, I'll tell you the two things that I want my brothers to be feeling right now, and it's distressed and angry. That's what I want them to be feeling, angry at themselves and distressed. I want them to be shaking in their boots right now. They're finally going to get what they deserve. But instead, he is given great grace to forgive his brothers. And he says, God sent me before you to preserve life. What wonderful perspective and forgiveness. Give me some of what Joseph has, eh? I wish I had that perspective all the time. The same idea is captured in Genesis 50. It's why we're doing this thematically. This is the very last chapter of the book of Genesis, so we're skipping to the end. Anybody like doing that, skipping to the end of the book? Uh, We're skipping to the end of the book. Jacob has thus died. The 11 brothers are now nervous because what if Joseph has just been kind to them so that dad doesn't get mad at Joseph? So we can stay in Joseph's good favor. So the 11 brothers, you know, it's been, it's actually been 17 years since they came into Egypt. So it has been 37 years since they sold Joseph into slavery. They are now well, Joseph is 57 years old at this point. They are, they're in their, they're firmly in their middle age, if not older years at this point. 
And they say, we need to approach Joseph again. And they go to Joseph and they say, so um, Joseph, before dad died, he came and talked to us. And he wanted us to make sure that you know that he wants you to be nice to us even after he's gone. I mean, this is just, there's nothing recorded that Jacob did this. They're probably just like coming up with a story. But if it's Jacob that was causing you to be kind, we just ask that you remember that and that you continue to be kind to us even though he is gone. And, and more than that, please remember that we're really sorry like they just throw a last little apology in there. Like, you know, uh, a long time ago, I'm sorry, uh, will you forgive us? How does Joseph respond? Well, kind of in classic form, uh, the emotional Joseph that he is, he starts weeping before the question is even all the way out of their mouths. The fact that they have to come and ask this, he just, he's flabbergasted by it. And here's what he says. Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive, as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Joseph, after being sold into slavery and having so many terrible things happen to him, is able to continually express to his brothers that God meant this for good. He's just a machine, this Joseph. There's nothing that can get him down. It reminds me, and this might be a niche, a niche um, illustration for, for y'all, maybe someone knows what I'm talking about here, but in a famous NBA moment, uh, this uh, universal pest named Matt Barnes takes the basketball and just acts like he's gonna throw it right into Kobe Bryant's face. And Kobe just doesn't even flinch. He just stands there like a, like a statue. And that's what I imagine Joseph kind of being like. Like nothing can get this guy. He's just a machine. He's resolved. He's trusting in the Lord. Here's his opportunity. He has all the power in the world. He can get the vengeance if he so desires it. Yet he's able to say to those who perpetrated great evil against him, him, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Friends, what could possibly cause a man to be this forgiving and this kind? What could possibly help this man to give up the grudge and to show this type of grace and forgiveness? He doesn't make them pay penance. He doesn't do anything. What's his secret? I want it. I don't want it. I want to be unbothered as Joseph is unbothered. Don't you want to be unbothered as he is unbothered? Like, don't you have people in your life who you would just wish that you could forgive? Like, there's just part of you that's like, oh, that just bothers me so much. I want to be unbothered like him. What's the secret? No, here's the secret. He tells us what the secret is. It's right before he says, you intended it for evil. He says this. He looks at his brothers and he says, do not fear, for, I'm, for am I in the place of God? Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? Here's Joseph's secret. He's letting God be God. Because when you try to be God, nothing will go right. But when you let God be God, you can trust in his plan, and you can know that he will get the last word. Let God be God. That, seem, that seems so intuitive, so simple, like something that all of us Christians should already have mastered at this point. Let God be God. What, 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 what am I talking about? Am I thinking that maybe I'm God and he's not God and I'm going, to be, I'm going to take over? There's a word for people who think that they're God and it's lunatic, okay? There's, every psych ward in Boston is filled with 14 reincarnations of the person of Jesus Christ, if you walked in the doors today saying, I am God, I would be shocked. I don't think that there are many of us who did that. But the reality is that all of us attempt to stand in the place of God all the time because we want control over our lives. And only God has control. We know only God has control, but we want the control. And so we attempt to stand in God, but, uh, in God's place. But here's what Joseph says. He says, let God be God. 
I trust in God, is what he's saying. Friends, we must let God be God. Because when you try to be God, nothing will go right. When you try to be God, it's like taking your personal dinghy out into the ocean of life. You're going to be tossed. You're going to end up on one of those kook slam videos on Instagram where you're just like hammered by the waves. You're just going to be devastated. But when you let God be God, it's like you're loading up into the ocean liner of who he is. The waves are still there, but you're trusting that you, and you barely even notice them. You become resolved. You become someone like Joseph who is just able to handle what life swings at him, he's given proper perspective. So how can you handle whatever life hands to you but let God be God? I have four ways that you can cultivate a heart that perpetually let, lets God be God. Four ways that you can cultivate a heart that perpetually lets God be God. And I think this is really important for us because if we wanna handle the struggles of life, we need to be able to know how to let God be God. And here are four ways that we tend to try to be God in our own life, and four perspectives and things that we can start doing to let God be God. And the first one is this. Stop defining your own moral code of conduct. God gets to say what is right and what is wrong, and so often we look inside for what feels right or what feels wrong to us, and that's how we define what is right or wrong. But God gets the ultimate say of moral authority, not only in our lives, but in the world. Almost every sin starts with, instead of saying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, we say, my kingdom come, my will be done. This is the beginning of our life of sin and rebellion against God. If you look at your life, church, just a simple analysis, and nothing seems to be going right. Everything seems to be off. Could it be? Not always. Certainly not always. As we see with Joseph, he's, he's righteous through this whole thing, and, and he's not through the whole thing, but he is uh, more or less following God's will, and yet he does have some terrible things happen in life. But for some of us, it could be that God is trying to get our attention. Could it be that you are miserable because you are living in willful disobedience to God? Could it be that he is trying to get your attention, that you are being tossed and fro by the waves of life because you're out at sea by yourself and you've refused to get on the ocean liner? Could it be that you're trying to decide what is good and evil for yourself? instead of submitting yourself to God's word. This is not something that's easily realized for us because it requires humility and it requires us to take an actual look at ourselves and say, you know what, I could be wrong. But there's no group of people who should be more quick to say when they are wrong than Christians. It is unfortunately untrue that Christians are usually because Christians are usually the ones that are very resolved to insist that they are always right, but we should be some of the most open-minded people because before we came to know God, we, said that we, we admit that we were wrong about the thing that most defined us. We were wrong about how we were living. And so we come to God and he saves us. And so now we have to say, look, I have to evaluate. Maybe I'm wrong. We have to be open-minded with these things. And we, you have to consider... You know, I've thought that I've been living the way that God wants me to, but maybe there's a way that I've been in rebellion. So that's the first way, to cultivate a heart that perpetually lets God be God. But look, they get, they get a little bit more deeper, okay? That one's like pretty obvious, all right? Here, here's another one. You can cultivate a heart that lets God be God by allowing God to meet the needs of those in your life allowing God to meet the needs of those in your life. How many of us try to help people ourselves instead of pointing them to God, who's what they really need and what, who has what they really need? I think about my children. I don't want my children to suffer ever. 
But yet, I know that they have to suffer from time to time because they're humans. And this is how God produces character and character produces perseverance. This is how the Lord does it. This is how the Lord shows them that they need him. I don't want them to suffer. I want them to find they're all in me. But when I want them to find they're all in me, what am I doing? I'm saying, let me be your God. I can fix your problems. Now, we want to step into each other's lives and image God and love each other as God loves us. But when we start saying, just trust in me instead of trust in God, we are failing them. We're setting ourselves up for a job that we are not qualified for. You are not qualified to meet the needs, uh, to meet every need of every person around you. You just are not qualified for that. There's a name for that. It's called codependency, when we feel like we have this need to be needed, and that's how we find our joy and satisfaction. We have to have people be happy with this. When Joseph's brothers come to him, how would you des- describe their emotional state after Jacob's gone? They're worried, right? They're anxious. They're saying, hey, Joseph, can you, can you say something to put our minds at ease? And he does. He does say something to put their minds at ease. But first, what does he say? He says, I am not God. Before you come to me, go to the Lord and trust in him. They need to go to God with their worries. Uh, with this prayer meeting that we're starting, we, we referenced the newsletter. And in the newsletter, I, I told about a story of when we went to New York this past week and met with some leaders there of a church that does a prayer room. And uh, afterwards, we got breakfast with the leaders and asked a lot of questions. One of the questions I brought up was, so being, being the only full-time pastor of the church, this is an obvious question for me. So you have people coming every week or every day to pray with you. And does that cause a lot more like pastoral responsibility because like maybe it's trudging up things, maybe they wanna to talk to you about stuff and the leaders of, because I'm concerned about my schedule, okay? Um, and uh, the leaders said, you know what? It's the exact opposite because I had someone that scheduled a meeting with me a couple of weeks ago. This is the leader uh, that, that we were speaking to. He said, someone scheduled a meeting and wanted to talk with me about something. So I said, cool, come to prayer, we'll meet after. We'll go get breakfast. So he comes to prayer. I can see he's engaging with the Lord at the prayer meeting. It's like half prayer, half worship. It's, it's this wonderful thing. And then he like connects with them afterwards. It's like, hey, bro, you ready to go get some breakfast? And he's like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I talked to God, worked it out. I'm good. He's like, all right. You see, sometimes we have to let God be God. There are some problems that we cannot solve. When you look at your friend and see that they're suffering, yes, please try to help them. But first, speak to the one who can give them what they most need. Let God be God in their lives. And let God be God in your life. Trust in him. You are not qualified to meet the emotional needs of everyone around you. The third way to cultivate a heart that lets God be God so you can handle whatever life throws at you is this. And it's a more challenging one. Release your grudges. Release your grudges. When you let God be God, this is what you can do. You can know that God gets the last say. And so you don't have to hold on to this grudge so that one day you might get the last word so that one day you might be shown righteous and right above everything, so that one day you might be able to give them what they ultimately deserve, but you can trust that God is almighty and that he gets the last word, that he is just. This is probably what Joseph was most referring to in in this. He says, brothers, am I in the place of God? Brothers, it is not up to me to execute justice. You come to me wondering if I'm going to execute justice. It's not up to me in this matter to execute justice. The Lord gets justice, and because of that, I don't have to hold a grudge against you. Let's just say you're driving down the road. I don't know how many of you drive, but I'm sure that many of you have been in a car. Um, Let's just say you're going down the road, and there's another driver on the road, 
And man, I get angry sometimes. Uh, I have to go to the Lord with that. But uh, this other driver speeds past you, just going like double the speed limit. They're swerving in and out of traffic. They're littering, throwing things out the window. I mean, they're just doing everything, okay? Well, I just feel, I feel like I should like call the police. I'm like, what can I, oh, they need to get justice. Like, what can I do? I wanna like call the police. I wanna like roll down my window and yell at them like a true Bostonian. I, I just want to see them get what they deserve. But let's say you see that person a moment later pulled over to the side of the interstate with a cop car behind them. And how does that make you feel? Good. <laughs> Makes me feel good. <laughs> yeah, good is the word I'm looking for there. Because they're getting what they deserve. I don't feel the need to roll down the window anymore. I'm just happy. This is how Joseph feels. <laughs> He knows that he's not the ultimate authority, that there is an ultimate authority who does have the final say always, and so he can just trust, he can just lay back, like, ah, oh, God's gonna get them. Like, what, either God's gonna get them or it's gonna fall on someone else. It's going, but he's always just, and the other person being Jesus Christ, his, his descendant that's coming. God has the last word. He always does what's just, and Joseph knows that God always does what just, and so he lets it go. He lets God have the last word. And the last way that you can cultivate a heart that lets God be God, and it's certainly, we've been kind of going from the easiest to the hardest, and this one's certainly the hardest, um, and it feels simple, but it, it's definitely the hardest. It's by letting God be in charge of your life by trusting that God knows what he's doing in your life, by trusting that he has a plan, that you might not be able to see the whole plan, but that he has a plan. And this is what Joseph does. He trusts it. That's why he's able to say, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Because now he's in this point where he can see God's plan and he says God's plan next. He says, this all happened, all this happened to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You see, Joseph is given a divine perspective. He's able to see why everything had to happen exactly the way it did. If he was not the favorite child, if he was not given that robe of many colors, if he was not thrown into the pit, if he was not sold into slavery, if he was not a spoiled brat that caused all of those things, if he was not sent down into Egypt, and if he was not in the home of Potiphar, and if he had not been taught the ways of God so that he would resist Potiphar's wife, if he had not been thrown into prison, if the, the cupbearer had not been thrown into prison, if he had not interpreted the dream and been brought up to talk to Pharaoh and then been put in charge of everything in Egypt, not only would he be dead, but all of his brothers would be dead. You see, God had a plan all the way and it required the smallest detail at the beginning from his father just spoiling him a little bit too much. Every step along the way, God had planned out. Now, I do wonder what Joseph would have said had his 11 brothers shown up while he was in, while he was about nine years into his prison sentence in the Egyptian prison. You see, he has the benefit of being able to see God's plan now. He's looking at it and he's like, look, this all happened so that I'd be in charge so that we'd all live. I like to think that maybe Joseph would have said if they had showed up just a few years earlier, I don't know how God's going to bring all this out to good, but I know that he is because I trust in him. I would like to think that. I don't know that to be true. But I know that it is true. Whether you find yourself in the place of perspective or if you find yourself in the middle of the story somewhere, God has a plan. I've told this story before, probably a couple times, um, and it just is the best one I have for this. Um, when I was in seminary, I uh, was in a, a dating relationship and thought I was thought this was it, thought we were gonna get married. And uh, I, I 
Uh, she broke up with me on a Friday morning, and you know, it's like you know, the Lord graciously spared me from that one. Okay, can I, can I get an amen there? Anybody ever been graciously spared? Um, so uh, I was trying to get my mind off of it, so I did what I like never did. I think this was the only time I ever did this in the entire time I was in seminary. I went out onto the seminary lawn and I played Ultimate Frisbee with a bunch of dudes. They were always playing. Uh, while playing Ultimate Frisbee, I met someone who didn't have a car. So for some reason, they were living in Louisville, Kentucky, and they didn't own a car because I think it was like broken down or something. Who needed a ride? to church that Sunday. So I invited him to come to our church, but he wanted to go to a morning service. So I drove him to the morning service, but I wanted to go to the evening service. So I've, I've been around the block a time or two at church. Uh, I know if I don't have anything to do that there's a whole wing of the church that always needs people. And so I went to the kids ministry and I said, hey, do you guys need anybody for today? And it's children's ministry. So they said yes. And they threw me in a room with 15 four and five year olds. And I guess their policies weren't as updated as ours because I was the only person in this room with 15 four and five year olds. And I was just being as gregarious as I possibly can, reading a book to them, being goofy. And then they, they put uh, a helper in there, a, a, a young woman uh, who was wearing a black dress, I remember very distinctly, and whose name was Megan, uh, in the same room. And afterward, I talked to the COA kids director, and I said, uh, or Sojourn kids director, our church was called Sojourn, and I, the kids director, and I said, hey, um, is she signed up to serve every week? Because sign me up. <laughs> but friends, if I had not been broken up with, if I had not decided to play Ultimate Frisbee, if my friend's car wasn't broken down, who, that friend is now the director of the Harbor Network of Churches, and I drove him to sojourn. So like, this was like a quintessential moment in his life. If, if I had not been broken up with that morning, then he wouldn't be where he is uh, today either. Um, but if those things had not happened, I'm not sure I'm in Boston. I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure I'm married to Megan. I'm not sure that my children exist. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> But God had a plan. He had a plan all the way from the beginning. Some of you might not, might be in a situation where you have no idea what God is doing. You don't have to. Let God be God. You don't have to backseat drive this whole thing. He knows where he's going. He knows what he's doing. Let God be God. He has a plan. You have a limited perspective. You have a very narrow view of what he's doing in your life. You do. You have a very narrow view of what God is doing in your life. And there's no way that you can see the whole plan. But here's what we know for certain. Romans 8, 28. For we know that those who love God, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And so God is working good. If you belong to Christ, he is working good, whether you can see it or not. And uh, I'm reminded of one of my favorite stories in the Chronicles of Narnia, okay? We're just gonna start passing it out uh, when you come in. Uh, I prom this is your second week with us? I'm sorry. Uh, I promise I don't do extended uh, uh, illustrations from the Chronicles of Narnia every week, but many of my illustrations are from that. Um, the Horse and His Boy, it's probably the least known of the seven books. It's, it's one of the more obscure ones. It's, it's definitely a, a kind of weird one. And that's because Aslan, the great lion, the Christ figure, he only shows up, as far as we know, like one time in the end. It's just like a couple pages with Aslan. And so it's kind of like one of these books. It reminds me of Esther. It reminds me of Joseph, where it's like you don't see God working very often, but then it all comes together at the end. But it's about this boy named Shasta who's living in a uh, magical world of Narnia, and, but he's in a far away nation of Tashpan. So he's in the same world as Narnia, but he's in a different nation than Narnia and Tashpan. So he goes on a very long journey with his talking horse named Bree on his way to Narnia. He's trying to get out of Tashpan and into 
Narnia. And he faces all kinds of obstacles. And at the end of the book, Shasta is uh, faced with a mysterious voice. He doesn't know where this voice is coming from, but he recognizes the voice and he's willing to talk to it. And Shasta is terrified by the voice. And he says, oh, I must be the unluckiest boy who's ever lived. I must be the unluckiest boy in the whole world. And the voice invites Shasta and says, tell me your sorrows. And so Shasta starts, and here's what he says. How, he, he, he told the voice how he had never known his real father or mother and had been brought up sternly by a fisherman. And then he told the story of his escape and how they were chased by lions and forced to swim for their lives and all the dangers in Tashban and about his night in the tombs and how the beast howled at him out of the desert. And he told how the heat and thirst of their desert journey and how they were almost at their goal when another lion chased them and wounded his friend Arvis and also how very long it had been since he had anything to eat. And so he just gives him this long sob story. I think we can all think of sob stories like this. And the lion says, I do not call you unfortunate. The lion, I just gave it away. The voice, <laughs> the large voice says, I do not call you unfortunate. And Shasta responds, what do you mean? Didn't you just hear me say I was chased by lions? To which the voice responds, and friends, I think that you can find yourself here. I was the lion who forced you to join Arvis. I was the cat who comforted you around the houses of the dead. I was the lion who drove the jackals from you while you slept. I was the lion who gave the horses the new strength of fear for the last mile so that you should reach King Loon in time. And I was the lion, you do not remember, who pushed the boat in which you lay, a child near death, so that it may come to shore where a man sat wakeful at midnight to receive you as a baby. And what this communicates so well is what Shasta had interpreted as evil. God was at work in each of these things to bring apart, to bring about his plan. Friends, I don't know what God is doing in your life but you gotta let God be God. You just gotta let him be God. You have to let him be in charge. You don't have all the information in front of you to understand the plan. When we think about the story of Jesus, or the story of Joseph, who went about unmanageable evil, but yet God meant it for good, our minds go directly to Jesus, the greater Joseph, who would have unimaginable evil committed against him. He'd be sold for a few pieces of silver, much like Joseph, killed unjustly by those he came to save. And it was all in God's plan because Jesus would be resurrected to save his people. There were seasons where Joseph didn't understand God's plan. He didn't know what God was doing. But Jesus, he knew all along. And yet he still went forward with the plan, though he knew what it was going to take. He willfully participated in all of this. Out of the great love with which he loved us, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. And for the joy set before him, he endured the shame of the cross. It brought him joy to bear the cosmic penalty for our sin. God brought good out of evil in Joseph's life. But the life of Jesus is the ultimate example of God bringing good out of evil. Those who nailed Jesus to the cross meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And with his dying words, Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Which is the same perspective that we see in his great uncle down the line, Joseph. Forgive them. They didn't know what they were doing. And he who gave up his only son for us, would he not also graciously give us all things? Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? 
Friends, if you are found in Christ, he means good in your life, even when you cannot see it. He wants good for you. He is good. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but I think you do. He is good, and he wants good for you. He is good, and he wants good for you. That is the man that we worship and who is in charge of everything and who we can depend upon. Each week we participate in a sacred meal that's really an invitation to come and commune with the God who is good and who wants good for his followers. As, as someone who follows Christ, you're invited to this meal. Um, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the loaf and he tore it and he said, this is my body broken for you. And he took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so each week we participate in the sacred meal and we're reminded of Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf. His body was broken, his blood was shed. If you're a Christian, we invite you to evaluate your life, to let God be God, to repent of sins that are left unrepentant, and to come and receive this meal. So, church, let's stand as we prepare to sing, to respond to what God's revealed to us in his word, and to trust him to be God in our lives. Father, I pray for anyone who's truly suffering today. God, I pray that they would not think that I'm making light of their suffering, but I pray that they would trust you with every step of it, that they would see that you are gracious and generous. God, that they would commune with you. We know that what they most need is not a cure to their suffering, but is a perspective from heaven. And so God, would you bring that heavenly perspective today? Would you help them to say, I trust in you? Would you help them to let you be you? And God, I just pray that you would be bigger in our lives. God, we need more of you. We need, I, I know that we would let you be you if we believed that you are who you say you are. That if we saw you as you are, that we would stop it with the charades of trying to be in charge. And we would just trust the one. We'd, we'd fall asleep in the back of the car. And so God, I pray that you would help us to stop trying to backseat drive our lives and to trust you with it, but God, also we, we want to be faithful with every, everything you're calling us to. God, we pray that you would bring comfort and joy this morning. We thank you for your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen.